to another episode of Decoding Danielle. We are at episode 28, and today we're going to be talking about the gift of prophecy from Daniel's time and other parts in scripture and right down to our time to see if the gift of prophecy is still being manifested. All right, so our topic today is Daniel and the gift of prophecy. All right, before we dive in, we're going to ask Elder David to pray to start. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you that um, through sundry times you talked to your children through the prophets of old, and then through the apostles, and then through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I just ask that uh, the spirit of Jesus himself would rest upon us, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that we would see uh, what your purpose is for us in these end times and how we can cooperate with you and that we would understand the messages that uh, are given in the spirit for us today. Father, I ask that you'd bless us, that our, the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so we're going to go right into our quiz. Then we're going to get started. All right, so again, we're doing episode 28, and our title is Daniel and the Gift of Prophecy. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, David? yes, that's good. Okay, all right, that's great. Just checking. All right, so let's dive in. All right, so our quiz number one is a true and false question. It says, the only difference between Christians and the non-Christians is that Christians go to church once a week. True or false? And number two, the reason why Christians today should keep high standards in their personal lives is that they have the hope of the second coming of Christ and are living in the judgment hour. True or false? Number three, the Christian's music, TV, movie, and reading habit should be in harmony with Philippians 4 and verse 8, which says that a Christian should think on those things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. True or false? And number four, the Sabbath begins at midnight on Friday night and ends at midnight on Saturday night. True or false? Interesting. Number five, the purpose of the Sabbath is for the Christian to build a deeper relationship with Christ. Therefore, you should do those things on the Sabbath that will enhance his relationship with Jesus. True or false? And now for the answer to see how you did. Number one is indeed false. And number two is true. Amen. Number three is true. And number four, uh, false. Yes, I knew that one, right? <laughs> and number five is true. All right, we're going to put up some scriptures for you guys to read. Isaiah 29, 13 and 13, and Matthew 15, verse 8. All right, so we're doing Daniel and the gift of prophecy. And I'm going to turn it now over to Elder David to tell us a little bit about the prophet Daniel. So what does the Bible teach about? prophets and prophecy uh, in Numbers 12, 6. Uh, do you have that, Gabby? Yes, I'm just right there. Verse 6, right? Yes, All right, let me get to the question. Numbers yes, 12, verse, 6. How yeah, does numbers. God communicate to the prophet, to a prophet? All right, Numbers 12 and verse 6 says, And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Okay, so visions and dreams. A dream occurs when a prophet sleeps, whereas a vision occurs while he's awake. These did, did not arise out of ordinary experiences of life, but were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And number two, did Daniel have dreams and visions? Daniel 7, 1, 8, 1. Yes, of course. We've looked at them, right? Yes. Number three, 
Describe some of the physical phenomena that accompanied Daniel while in vision. This one is pretty amazing. Daniel 10, 8, 9, 10, 17, and 18. It says, um, there was, uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to read those? All right. Um, I could share, share it on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. So there, there remained no strength in me. And B, then I was in deep sleep on my face. And C, a hand touched me, which set me upon my hands and my knees, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. D, neither was there any breath left in me. And E, he strengthened me. It's a good thing because he was passed out on the floor sleeping, right? Yes. And he was not even breathing. That's amazing. Yeah. So this was completely supernatural. You know what I see the Lord doing is um, when, when God is giving this depth of revelation, God actually puts the prophet into a, a state where their self, their natural being, is completely set aside so that mm. the spirit alone is able to communicate. You know what I've noticed that you, you listen to prophets on the news or on YouTube and stuff like that. And a lot of times there's a lot of self, self-interpretation. And I think it means this, I think it means that. Well, uh, with Daniel here with the with the true prophet of God, it's like your whole uh, nature is set set aside where only the spirit of God is doing the revelation and speaking and revealing. Mm -hmm. Certain physical phenomena accompany, accompany the prophet while in vision, demonstrating to those around them that they are receiving something that came from a supernatural source. And we're going to turn it over to you, the gift of prophecy in Bible times. Yeah, so thank you, Elder David, for introducing us to the prophet Daniel. And now we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy in Bible times. So we're going to go to the scriptures. And Elder David will help us to read. Second yeah. Peter. All right. So question four. Who is the source of the messages that the prophets received in vision? Second Peter 1 in verse 21. And it says, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right. So holy men of God moved as they were. As they were, sorry, holy men of God spake as they were moved, moved. by the Holy. So the source of the messages was not from the men themselves, but from the Holy Ghost. Of course, each writer would write according to their view of the building. You know, I once heard someone said. There are four people looking at the building and each write about the same building. So from their perspective, mm -hmm. but the same, describing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the synoptic gospel. All right, moving on to question five. Will God do anything on the earth without first telling his prophets? Let's find out what Amos 3 and verse 7 says. It says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophet. So the answer is, will God do anything without first telling his prophet? No, he's not going to do anything without telling his prophets. And these are some scriptures for you. In addition to Amos 3, 7, you can read Isaiah 46 and verse 9 and 10. All right. So before God does anything of significance involving um, his people on the earth, he first of all reveals it to the prophets and elder tell us, um, in Numbers 12 and verse 6, that it's through dreams and visions. Throughout biblical history, God spoke through a variety of individuals. Daniel was not unique in receiving the prophetic gift. God chose men and sometimes women, such as Miriam, and you can find us find that in Exodus 15 and verse 20. Huldah in 2 Chronicles 34, 22, and Anna, Luke 2, 36. God chose to give the prophetic gift to those individuals who could best serve him at the time. As one examines the prophetic gift in scripture, it becomes clear that there were two basic groups of prophets. One, those who writ, those, those whose written revelations are recording in, 
recorded in the Bible, such as Moses, Daniel, and John, the revelator on the Isle of Patmos. And number two, those whose writing did not form part of the sacred scripture or who only gave oral presentations, such as Enoch, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist. And yet these prophets were just as inspired as the other Bible prophets. So people can, you know, people can be regarded as prophets and not have their writings regarded as a part of sacred scripture. Do you agree, Elder David? Oh, yes. There were many right. prophets in the New Testament. Uh, um, one, one man had several daughters who were prophets. And, and you know, Silas was a prophet. And, and uh, Barnabas was a prophet. All of the ones that, that Paul went on his excursions with were prophets. Yes, amen. All right, number six, what is one of the gifts that God has given to his New Testament church? And we find this in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All right, so we see here the gift of being a prophet is just one of the spiritual gifts that God has given the, to the New Testament church. Do we still have evangelists, pastors, and teachers today? Absolutely. Sure. So then why not prophets? Let's explore. Number seven, how long were these gifts, including the gift of being a prophet, to remain in the church? Verse 13. It says till we all chapter. Yeah, it says till yes. we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's and a that only verse. Yes, until we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. When will we be made perfect? Perfect At the second coming. At the second coming of Christ, right? So we see here this, according to Ephesians 4.13, uh, we see clearly that these virtual gifts, including the gift of prophecy, are to remain in the church until the second coming, right? Paul, yeah, Paul's point is very clear. As long as we're on this earth, we will need all the gifts of the spirit, including the gift of prophecy. Number eight, what is the purpose of the gift of prophecy? First Corinthians 14 and verse three. It says, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto man to edification and exhortation and comfort. Right, so we see the purpose of the gift of prophecy is one, edification, two, exhortation, and three, four, comforting. So the gift of prophecy is not primarily the ability to predict the future, as many people think. Many Bible prophets, such as Daniel, did predict the future, but many others did not. Their work was to edify, exhort, and comfort the church. Thus, one can be a prophet without necessarily predicting the future. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Elder David to talk a little bit about the gift of prophecy beyond Bible times, but let's talk about the theory of prediction and present truth application. First thing we want to say, it is biblical. When you talk about the flood, remember the flood? Methuselah, the here he died, will come. And then it happened just as it is. We remember now, right? The Exodus prediction, 430 years of pilgrimage, the 400 years of affliction. And it did happen by Moses, right? On the very the, day. Exactly, right? The Babylonian exile prediction, 70 years of Babylonian cap captivity. And it came to pass with, you know, with the prophets Daniel, Haggai, um, Zechariah, right? With That's Jeremiah right. predicting that. So right throughout the scripture, even the Messiah prediction, was it predicted that the Messiah would come? Yes. Sure, right? Daniel predicted it. John the Baptist spoke about it. Jesus Christ, it was fulfilled. He said it. He knew that it was his time, right? Yes. Was the judgment our prediction when the judgment would start in heaven yes, at the end of 2300 years? Yes, Daniel predicted that. And then it the present truth application was through the vision of Ellen White, through Sister White. And we're going to talk more about that later. All right, over to you, Elder David. All right, the gift of prophecy beyond Bible times. What counsel did Apostle Paul give to the Thessalonians concerning the gift of prophecy? First Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. 
Okay, it says, quench not the spirit. That's verse 19, verse 20. Despise not prophecies in verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So if God did not plan to send prophets after Bible times, Paul would have cautioned the Thessalonians to discard, disregard anyone in the future who would claim to have the prophetic gift. Instead, Paul tells them not to neglect the prophets, but to prove them. And if they prove true, to hold fast to their teachings. Certainly, Paul believed prophets would exist in the future. Right. Good Amen point. to that. Yeah. Number 10, what kind of prophets did Jesus warn against? Matthew 7, 15. Very interesting, right? <laughs> Would Jesus warn against any kind of prophet? Isn't a prophet a good thing? Well, the Bible says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Yes, Jesus said over and over, beware lest anyone teach you, for many will come in my name, saying... Notice that if there were not going to be genuine prophets, Jesus would have warned against all prophets. The fact that he warned against false prophet indicates the presence of the genuine. It's only logical. Right. Yes. Number 11. Who does Malachi suggest will appear before the coming of the Lord? Malachi 4, 5. And it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is interesting, isn't it? That this is a dual prophecy. Um, yeah. Remember, the disciples asked Jesus, why did the, Pharisee, the, the Pharisees say that Elijah will come first? And Jesus said, Elijah will come first and will restore all things. But I say unto you, he's already come. And they knew he was talking about John the Baptist. Right. So Jesus showed that John the Baptist was a type of Elijah the prophet. But he said that Elijah will come. He said that so there's still a future application. Right. Because it says uh, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? All right. Yes. So I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Notice the connection with the coming of Elijah is the gift of prophecy. It is not simply Elijah, but Elijah the prophet who is to come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And number 12, what great revival of the prophetic gift did the prophet Joel foresee in Joel 2, 28 to 30? All right, verses 28 reads, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaid in those days will I pour out my spirit. Verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. So, at what time will this great prophetic outpouring take place? Joel 2.31. You just read that, right? The sun shall be turned to darkness before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come. So, it's definitely talking about end time. Uh, I know. Then... I didn't read verse 31. We were okay. at verse go ahead, 12. Go ahead and, go ahead and read Number... that. Okay, verse 31 says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. So it's definitely talking about the time of the end, right? Right, yes. Joel predicted that sometime after the darkening of the sun, which was fulfilled in May 19, 1780, See, remember lesson 23, we talked about that. And before the coming of the Lord, this great prophetic gift would be restored to the church. Number 14, in what group of people would the prophetic gift appear at this time? Joel 2, 28 to 32. Yeah, I just needed you, to read verse 32, 32 in addition. Yeah, so it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord had said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. 
So it says, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And we talk about the remnant in, in uh, the book of Revelation. Yes. What does it say about the remnant in the book of Revelation? What are the two biblical identification points of the remnant? Revelation 12, 17. Okay. Revelation 12 and verse 17 says, well, in the a popular scripture, and the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's clear that the remnant, um, the final, final movement of God's people, uh, will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony, testimony of Jesus. Joel predicted that the remnant church would have the gift of prophecy. One of the identifying marks of the remnant church, according to Revelation 12, 17, is that they not only keep the commandments of God, but they also have the testimony of Jesus. So what is the testimony of Jesus? I think the Bible tells us what that is. Yeah. Look, look up Revelation 19 and verse 10. Yeah, and it says, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Mm. It's the spirit that works in the prophets. It's the prophetic gift. Yes. And number 17. What is the spirit of prophecy? What is the spirit of prophecy and prophets? Now, is the spirit of prophecy and prophets the same thing? Compare Revelation 19, 10, 22, 8, and 9. Yeah, so I just read 19, 10. So I'm just going to read okay. verse chapter 22, the last chapter verses okay. eight and nine and it says and i john saw these things and heard them and when i had heard and seen i fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things then saith thee unto me see thou do it not for i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book who worship god so it's so, it's the same same thing same. right Yes. Yeah. So uh, in nineteen ten says, "I am of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus," and in twenty two nine it says, "I am of thy brethren the prophets." So the testimony of Jesus is the same as the prophets. Note Revelation nineteen ten and twenty two nine are identical, except that Revelation nineteen ten refers to the spirit of prophecy, and Revelation twenty two nine calls them prophets. Thus, one of the marks that identifies the remnant church is that they will have the gift of prophecy. That's pretty clear. Well, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you for the gift of prophecy today. That ought to be interesting. Yes, yes, yes. So you might be wondering if the gift of prophecy is still manifested today. So we're going to um, talk about that. So the Bible foretells that in the last days before the coming of the Lord, God will raise up a remnant, a church that will keep all the commandments of God, and that will also have the gift of prophecy. Now, in order to qualify as a remnant church, the church must have the gift of prophecy. The same gift that inspired the prophet Daniel will be duplicated, so to speak, in the end time by a restoration of the gift of prophecy to the church. Now, did God fulfill this prediction? Did he send the gift of prophecy to the remnant church after the darkening of the sun that Elder David talked about in 1780? Well, in December 1844, a 17-year-old girl by the name of Ellen Harmon, later to become known as Ellen White, in frail health, possessing only a third grade education, received her first vision while kneeling in prior with a group of women in Portland, Maine. She shrank from the prospect of being called a prophet. You know, I've heard where she said, I'm not a prophet, I'm a messenger. Yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. want to be a prophet either. <laughs> yes, because she, she did more than tell us about prophecies, right? There's so right. much that was, yeah. So she's a messenger, okay? <laughs> Yet she dared not 
uh, be disobedient to the heavenly vision. And so she related what God had shown her. For 69, almost 70 years, she continued to receive visions and dreams from the Lord. She became one of the most prolific female writers in history with over 50 books still published today. Was this a genuine or counterfeit, man counterfeit manifestation? Was it a fulfillment of the biblical promise that the prophetic gift would be restored to the church at the end time? Let's see what the Bible says. Question 18, what physical phenomena accompanied Ellen White's vision? Now, you know, interestingly enough, Gabby, there were two men that received the very same vision, but they didn't have the courage to to speak what God had shown them and then they lost out and finally after that God says I'm going to give it to the weakest of the weak and truly this poor girl was very very weak she was she was uh, of poor health and she was many times she was on the verge of death yes you know it was just today I was looking at it you know, I sometimes look at numbers. I was like looking up Ellen White. So I think I was teaching a class and she just came into my mind during like one of the breaks in between the class. And I was like, oh, Ellen White was 17 years old when she got her first vision. And then 70 years later, she died. And then I was like, that's total of 87 years old. And I was like, look at that, 777. You know, I was just like looking at the seven and just right. smiling. But I'm, I don't believe in numerology. So don't interpret that as that. I just <laughs> sometimes, you know, as a math teacher, I like to play along with numbers. <laughs> they are very Interesting, you know, and, yeah. so, and and you know, I don't think it's coincidental that it was fourteen generations uh, between the, the flood and and Abraham, and then Abraham and David, and and you know, all these different fourteen generations. God seems to use numbers too. So I, I'm not a, a, a conspiracy numerologist, but I'm a biblical numerologist for sure. <laughs> Yes, he does. He does. Amen. Yes. So, you know, Ellen's white experience was very similar to that, that of the prophet Daniel. And mm -hmm. we're going to look at some of the ways which it was, you know, Elder David uh, talked about Daniel in the beginning about the prophet Daniel. And we're going to look a little bit at that. First, she did not breathe during her visions. Hmm. Sometimes her vision lasted for as long as four hours. Physicians who examined Ellen White in vision marveled that she did not breathe, yet still lived. And Elder David talked about that earlier, how God just completely take over that person. B, at times like Daniel, Ellen experienced a loss of physical strength replaced by supernatural strength. During one vision, she held at a, she held a 17 pound family Bible outstretched in her hands for 30 minutes. At that time, she weighed 97 pounds and was in frail health. Obviously, there was supernatural strength. Can we deny this? And that's a picture on your screen there. I've been, I've held that very Bible in my own hand. And I tell you what, I was in good shape and I couldn't hold it up five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I did. In, I think in South Africa when I visited there, I was, I was like, no, this is too. <laughs> I yeah, just took a picture very with heavy. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I managed to take a photo and that was it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, the physical phenomena accompanying the prophet indicate that there is something supernatural about their experience. However, the physical phenomena don't tell us whether the experience is from God or Satan. We must then examine the biblical test of a prophet, right? The biblical, to determine whether the prophet is from God or Satan. So let's look at some scripture. And the first one we're going to do is question 19. What is the first? And we're going to do a couple of these. So please take note. And you might want to write these down. What is the first biblical test of a prophet? Isaiah 8 and verse 20. It says. What is the first biblical test? test of a prophet isaiah 8 and verse 20 it says uh, to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them all right so we're talking about the law and we're talking about the testimony let's break that down so we can understand that and you can write down notes now the expression the law and the testimony was an old testament expression for the bible the law referred to the first five books of Moses, and we usually call that the Pentateuch, 
right? And the testimony referred to the testimony of the prophet, that is the rest of the Old Testament. The basic meaning of the text is that the prophet must agree with scripture or is not a genuine prophet. This point must be very clear. Any person today who claims to be a prophet must be tested by scripture. What God reveals to his prophets today will not disagree with what he has previously revealed in the Bible because the Lord God is the same today, yesterday, and even forevermore. So the Bible is the supreme revelation. If a prophet disagrees with scripture, that person is clearly a false prophet. As one examines Ellen White in this area, he finds total agreement with scripture. The student is invited to take any book written by Ellen White and examine what she says with the Bible. In every case, the student will find that Ellen White agrees with the scripture. Amen. All right, question 20. What is the second test of a prophet? 1 John 4 and verse 2. This is important. It says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Amen. So not only do they um, the Bible, but they also confess Jesus Christ that he came in the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. So true prophets will attest to the humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ. They will elevate and exalt Jesus Christ. To test Ellen White in this area, one has only to read her books such as Desire of Ages, Christ Object Lessons, Steps to Christ, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, and so on. And one very quickly sees that she beautifully fulfills this test of the prophet. An example of Ellen White's constant uplifting of Jesus Christ is seen in the passage um, that was quoted in our exhibit for today. It is a passage that gives counsel to pastors and how they should preach. So she always exalt Jesus Christ in her writings. Take a read someday if you have not, or reread too. All right, let's look at the third test. What is the third test, Bible test of a prophet, according to Matthew 7 and verse 20? And it says, wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. All right. So not only do they speak according to the, all the Bible and confess Jesus, but their fruits, the fruits that they bear. The Bible prophets were not perfect, nor is any prophet perfect. They were human, right? But the general tendency of the life must be in harmony with the word of God. Right. Yes. And there is a quotation here, Elder David. It says 70 years is a long time to live and work before the public under the critical eyes of millions of people talking about Ellen White. Largely skeptical, doubtful, uncertain, suspicious, and in some cases hostile. If any false errors or inconsistency existed, they would be exposed with great satisfaction by opponents. Mrs. White lived in various places, New England, Michigan, Switzerland, Australia, and California. She traveled extensively in many parts of the United States, Europe, and Australia, but the fruit of her life and labors attests to her godliness, her sincerity, her zeal and earnestness her upright and noble character, and her consistent Christian conduct. The life of Mrs. White is an example worthy of emulation by all. She was a humble, devout disciple of Christ and ever went about doing good, honored and respected by all who appreciate noble womanhood, consecrated to unselfish labor for the uplifting and better men of mankind. So her life testified she bore the fruits. And we should too. Yes. All right, 22. What is the fourth Bible test of a prophet? Jeremiah 28 and verse 9. It says, The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Amen. So, what they said, so the final biblical test of a prophet is fulfilled predictions. Bible prophets gave predictions that dealt with the main themes of the great controversy and salvation, not mundane things such as winning elections, you know, right, right. <laughs> astrology, you know, stars and all of those. If the, if the prophet predicts the future, it will come to pass. If the prophecy fails, 
the prophet would not be genuine. Like most Bible prophets, Ellen White did not give a lot of predictions. Her work was to edify, as we spoke about earlier on, exert and comfort the church. We heard you in the background saying those three. Yet there were times when she did give predictions and on these, she can be tested. Like Bible prophets, her predictions were sometimes conditional upon obedience, but her insights clearly reveal the prophetic voice speaking through her. So Elder David, could you read a little bit from point C for us that talks about um, predictions coming true? Uh, in 1980, Ellen White wrote, disasters by rail will become more and more frequent. Confusion, collisions, and death without a moment's warning will occur on the great lines of travel. Messages to young people, April 21, 1890. That prediction reads like today's newspaper, yet was written long before the advent of mod modern means of travel and communication. In 1850, modern spiritualism that purported to communicate with the dead had its origin in the Fox sisters and their mysterious wrappings in Hydesville, New York. At that time, the phenomenon was regarded as atheistic and having nothing to do with religion. Yet Ellen White wrote in 1850, I saw that the mysterious knockings in New York was the power of Satan and that such things would be more and more common, clothed in a religious garb so as to lull and de the deceived to greater security. Early writings, page 43. When spiritualism celebrated the centennial of the origins of modern spiritualism in 1948, the spiritist said this, Spiritism in its signs and wonders, visions and healing gifts was the religion of the apostles, of the post-apostolic fathers and the primitive Christians. Centennial Book of Modern Spiritualism, 1948, page 115. 100 years after its beginning, spiritualism claimed to be what Ellen White had said it would become. Amen. Ellen White wrote volumes in the days of health and nutrition, a very recent science today. Nearly everything that Ellen White wrote in, his, in this field has been verified by modern scientific research. In 1959, Dr. Clive McKay, former professor of nutrition at Cornell University, issued this statement. In spite of the fact that the works of Ellen White or Mrs. White were written long before the advent of modern scientific nutrition, no better overall guide is available today. You know, one of my favorite stories is that um, when Ellen White lived out in St. Helena, California, where I used to live, I used to go to her house there. Uh, the mm -hmm. leaders of the church were in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. And, and back then, it took several weeks for mail to get from California to Michigan. There was uh, one night that she had a dream, and in the dream, in the dream or a vision, she saw the leaders of the church sitting down and discussing over an important issue. And they were making a getting ready to make a decision that would lead them in a wrong direction. And so she was very concerned. She woke up and she wrote them a letter as quickly as possible and she mailed it. Two or three weeks later, when that message arrived, it arrived at the very time that that meeting that she had foreseen was actually taking place. They were mm. literally discussing the topics and here a letter was passed to them. They opened it up and Ellen White had seen exactly who and what they were saying, who was speaking and what they were saying and which course the church should be, you know, the, give, give them a direction and take to take the right course. So she saw the very interaction, the very communication that they were doing that day, weeks before. Only the Amen. Lord can do that. Amen. I agree. Only the Lord. All right. You know, as one examines the life and the ministry of Ellen White. In relationship to the four Bible tests of a prophet, it becomes very clear that she meets every one of the tests. The physical phenomena indicated that we are dealing with a supernatural force as being from God. All right, question 23. What is the relationship of the writings of Ellen White to the Bible? Well, she uplifts the Bible. Um, Elder David, could you read again for us the last paragraph on page four? Um, 
It yeah, says these like, statements show clearly the purpose of Ellen White's gift. Her writings are not an addition to the Bible, but are given to keep us close to the Bible. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is deeply indebted to Ellen White. Because of her ministry, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has remained a Bible-based, Christian-centered movement throughout its history. Because of her life and ministry, the Adventist Church today is one of the most far-flung mission programs of any denomination. It was Ellen White who encouraged the church to engage in a worldwide ministry. Because of her Adventist today, operate one of the largest nonprofit healthcare systems in the United States and many hospitals around the world, as well as the largest Protestant parochial education system in the world. Mm -hmm. Because of the ministry of Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventists have conducted a balanced ministry, preaching the word, healing the sick, helping the poor. Adventists conduct, conduct one of the largest disaster and famine relief efforts in the world today. Adventists who follow the health councils given by Ellen White live nearly 10 years longer than the general population. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is deeply indebted to the ministry of Ellen White. That is true. So we see where Ellen White points to support and uplifts the Bible. Yes. So perhaps the most important point of Ellen White's ministry is the fact that she consistently pointed people to scripture. She always uplifted the Bible. The Bible predicted this gift would come in the last days to be a tremendous blessing to the church. And Elder David has just read for us the tremendous blessing to this our church. The evidence points out that it has come. Now let's review. Oh, yeah, we already spoke about those. All right, so question 24. Are you thankful that God has fulfilled his word by restoring the prophetic gift to the remnant church in these last days? Amen. I sure am thankful. <laughs> restoring the prophetic gift. We need that gift. All right, so four points should now be clear about the four tests. And the first one we were talking about, God's medium of communication is the prophets. The gift of prophecy is to exist in the church until the end of time. The gift of prophecy is to be restored to the church in the last days after the darkening of the sun. We spoke about that earlier. The last, and I think number four, one of the identifying marks of the remnant church is that it will have the gift of prophecy in its midst. And friends, we are about to the end right now. So I want to ask you these you know, very solemn questions. And we hope that you're considering these questions. Number one is if you are thankful that God has given this most precious prophetic gift to the remnant church in these last days through Ellen White, we want you to type comment, type amen in the comments. Whenever you're watching this, maybe two years from now or three years from now. And Elder David, can you read the second one? It's two pages, but yeah. I have seen that the Seventh-day Adventist Church meets the two main characteristics of the remnant church. That is, a keep the commandments of God, and they have the gift of prophecy. If it is your desire to prepare to become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, prayerfully raise your hand, your right hand. Yeah, I'm already a member. <laughs> yes, me too. Yeah, but for those who are thinking about I, it. I was born and I left it. And, you know, after I left it and I went my own way, I knew, I just knew that there was a time when God was calling me back. He had a purpose and a plan for me that had something specific to do in these end times. Um, God is calling and raising a group of people. Who are part of a movement to bring the everlasting gospel, the three angels message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's a worldwide movement, and God is calling for recruits even right now. Amen. I, I can't agree with you more. It is indeed true. All right, friends, our next lessons for next week is going to be very interesting. It is what happened on earth in 1844, and we can't wait to to see you there. All right, so we're gonna come back to our main screen. Elder David, I just have to agree with you. You know, there are many persons who have left the church, but you know, God is calling them back in yes. and he's empowering them to do the work 
So if you are one of those such persons and you've wandered away from the Lord, you know, this beautiful story in the Bible, um, Elder David, that talks about the prod prodigal son. Yes. It's one that is so beautiful. He recognized where he was and his place. Um, and before we pray, Elder David, what do you think about the son that was at home? I think he he just uh, <laughs> he lost the appreciation uh, and the beauty of being able to live with the father. And he was so caught up in his own stuff that he began, you know, he. He was jealous. <laughs> wasn't wasn't a Christian attitude at all. <laughs> <laughs> He should, you know, he should have wanted what was best for his brother. If he loved his brother, he would have been thankful that he was home safe. And I but think sometimes it exposes our selfish human nature. Prideful, rebellious, stubborn, <laughs> and independent. Yeah, and it's the same thing I was considering, you know, when someone comes into a church that probably have backslidden, you know, how is our reaction to them? Are we so happy that they're back and yes. ready to pour out all the love that because we've been with the father, right? Like that brother that was at home. Yes. And it makes you think and it exposes you too, as Elder David says. So, you know, <laughs> I, I remember preaching a sermon and I was telling my testimony how I had left the Lord and gone out and uh, followed my own way in the world and stuff. And I remember a young lady coming up to me and afterwards, and she says, I guess I just need to leave the church and go out and go crazy like everybody else so I can have a real experience. And I just felt so bad for her because you can have a real experience without doing all that stuff that damages and impairs you and, mm. and, debilitates you and will leave scars on you for the rest of your life. You don't have to go through that. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> all right, let's just pray for our viewers right now, Elder David. Maybe some are, you know, have left their father's home. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right, let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for this beautiful lesson tonight that we learn about the gift of prophecy. Lord, we also want to pray for our Facebook friends and our YouTube friends and all those who might be watching this on Instagram or any other platform. Lord, maybe they have wandered away from you and they want to come back home. We pray that, you know, they will recognize how much you love them. It doesn't matter what we have done. You just want us to come back home to you for your love is so rich, so pure, so deep. You died for us. That's how much you were willing to give up mm -hmm. to buy us back. Lord, we thank you for redemption. And Lord, I pray also for those who might be listening, who know someone who have wandered away from you, that they will... Be filled with the spirit to go out and to minister. We know your coming in is near. And we want everyone to, as much as possible, not only our family or friends, but every person to make it to the kingdom of God. Please watch over and guide the persons watching this program. Help them to make a full commitment, a total commitment to you, and to continue with you in prayer and Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, thank you for joining us and we will surely see you next week. So continue to pray for us as we keep you in our prayers. Any closing right. words, Elder David? Look like you wanted to say something quickly. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't planning on it, but <laughs> <laughs> I am very weary and my brain is <laughs> slowing down for rest for sleep, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are in different time zones, so that's true. <laughs> All right, God bless you, friends, and see you next week. <laughs> All right.